Okay, so now let's see how Peter's meter interacts with Paul's. Peter's going to be quoting Paul in Peter's own verse 3. But first let's look at the parallel of time. Peter does his little greeting here, which we now know is a reference to foreordination. Okay, how he was set up by God in eternity past, appointed apostle. He's standing on the stage announcing himself. But the timeline here is 18 BC to 8 BC. So this particular section of Peter is not parallel to Paul because when Paul starts this, that's one that that's well it, it, in our terms it ends up being like 2 BC I have to hone that down 2 BC 4 BC say when Christ is born in Paul's own Anno Domini accounting that's year one starting at the beginning of the year okay so he's covering the first 10 years of Christ's life when he says this and by year 10, Augustus, because Paul focuses on Roman emperors too, Augustus was named father of his country by this point. Augustus will die right here at U of Curio, which is AD 14. So Paul is using an Anno Domini accounting that Peter's adopting. So we got to find out what is, where in Peter do we, you know, tie up the text in Peter to Paul to see what Peter's doing with elaborating on Paul. Okay, so the point where Peter is tying to eulogetas in the upper right hand corner. See here, eulogetas, the first syllable, that would be Christ's birth. Is right there in Peter where you see the little black square just before diasporas. All right, because that's 1 AD in Peter. Okay, I mean, really, technically, it's D right here. All right, because that's four syllables, diasporas. All right, so D, it's just kind of really clever, especially if you know Latin, because deity, we get English deity from the Latin Deus. All right, so that's really kind of clever. Um, and then it's also the actual word is dia, and that means through, by agency of, by means of. Okay, so he's playing on Paul. Paul is saying God is worthy of praise, honor, and glorification. That's how my pastor translated that word, eulogetas. Okay, it, I mean, if you just translate it literally, it means well speaking, but idiomatically, it means worthy of praise, worthy of glory, worthy of honor, worthy of all kinds of the highest things that man can give another man. All right, so now he's ascribing all that to God. All right. So while Peter's going to end up quoting this whole section in verse 3, right now we're just tying time. And by means of the time, this is tying to this in Paul. So why is Peter doing that? Okay, because again, the birth of Christ is the fulfillment to all the Jews, including those in diaspora, which is the theme of Peter's letter is diaspora. Okay, and it's also the fulfillment of the promise to the Gentiles, which is in Isaiah 53, um, which in Hebrew starts at 52:13, and, and the specific prophecy to the Gentiles is in 52:14. Okay, our versification of Isaiah 53 is wrong. Isaiah 53 should start with 52.13. 52.14 is a province to the Gentiles. So, because Peter is writing to Gentiles, all right, he's hooking this here to this here in Paul, so that the Gentiles are, you know, because they memorize scripture by syllable counts too, they're tying that to Paul in the first 10 syllables. In the first 22 syllables, you know, here's verse, this is Christ age 20 at the end here. All right. He's 10 years old. Well, he's born here in Peter. So he's age 4 at the end of this. Okay. So 4 plus 19, he's 23 at the end of this. And he's age 20 at the end of this. So that, you know, there's a little bit of an overlap. 
But you see how, how it ties? Because Paul was writing to Gentiles. Peter's now writing to Paul's own stomping ground because Paul is dead. That's why Peter's writing. So he's reminding the Gentiles who got Ephesians, specifically Ephesians, to, you know, recognize that he's tying to them right here. And he's tying to that section of Paul right there. Okay? So you could sort of, I'm not sure if that's exactly how we're supposed to do it, but you could append this text to the end of this text. In other words, Yulagetas, Hoteos, Kaipater, Tukuriu, Hemon, Yesu Christu. And then you, then you pick it up here. You probably have to insert the word N. And diasporas, Pontu, Galetas, Cappadocias, Asias, Kai, Betunias. All right? In other words, they would be applying to themselves the Petrine text lower in black and gold and inserting it right after this. Okay? Or you could maybe put this Petrine text in front of Eulogetas here. In either event, it means the same thing. It's an amplification of the application to the Gentiles. Okay? To the Gentiles in specific. Because Peter's writing to the Gentiles and Paul is writing to the Gentiles. It, it also applied to the Jews. But the context is Gentiles. Context is church. So Peter is, is sort of like slowing you down by adding this, you know, text either before or after this text in Paul. Okay? Now, you would have much more reason, therefore, to say the next phrase, the one who is blessing us. You see? Us. Who is us? The Gentiles who are getting the letter from Peter. The Gentiles who got the letter from Paul. You see the point? So it's like, this is something, it's a technique in the Old Testament called antiphonal, antiphony. It's also a technique in other languages and other cultures. Where you have one side on, especially a church in, in liturgy, you have one side singing part of a key phrase, like here. And then you have the other side, you know, on, on, in a building, the other side chorus. You have a chorus on two sides, right and left, and you're in the middle watching both sides. The chorus on the left is singing Eulogetas, Hoteos, Kaipater, Tutkuriu, Hemon, Yesu Christu. Okay? And then the other side is like responding to give more information. Dias, probably they'd have to insert the word N. Diasporas, Pontu, Galetas, Cappadocias, Asias, Kai, Betunias. You see how that works? So it's the two sides singing to each other. Peter is, as it were, giving you text that sings back to Paul. Okay? And it's singing back to it at the same time zone. Because Peter is writing about the same time period here as Paul is writing here. So much so that he even stops to make a satire on Augustus being deified in the year he dies, which is A.D. 14. Okay, it's really hysterical. Now, Paul's writing in the past at this point, and Peter's writing in the past at this point. They're both going to go prophetical later. But right now, we're just looking at how the style is established based on something past that you already know at the time you're reading, so that you can further understand the future prophecy that both of these guys are going to launch into relative to the people who are reading what they wrote. Okay, so then this takes you to the Lords of age 23. All right, so that would be Hu Ho U Lo. Well, Ho Ho U Lo. Okay, so you, you're an un, that's an unfinished word, so you're going to want to go on from there. So now Peter's going to go on from there. Kata prognosin teu patros en ya and hagiasmoi numatos. All right? So that takes you to 41. Okay? 
So that would cover in Paul 20, go all the way past here, and that would take you here. Okay? 37 and Toy Sepu. Okay? So that takes you to 41. That text in Paul is being incorporated by Peter here. Now look how clever that is. What does it say in Paul if we put Peter last instead of first? Ho lo el wait a minute. Ho u lo gesas humas. En pasu logia numatiki. See look? Numatiki. Spirit. En toi sepu. That's as far as it goes. Okay, and what is Peter saying as a response? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by means of the sanctifying work of the, of the Spirit. See, these are all spiritual blessings. Okay, but who's doing the spiritual blessing? The Spirit. And hagiasmoi numatas. Numatas. See, isn't that cute? Peter's tracking to Paul's words and to Paul's content. Okay, and to us it sounds a little repetitive, you know, as moderns, but the Greeks loved repetition. Okay, they loved it. Foreknowledge of God. See? Blessed us. He's blessing us. And it's foreknowledge. Which, of course, is how Peter started his letter. Peter, who was appointed in eternity past. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and by means of the sanctifying work of the Spirit. As a result, see, that's if you read Peter first. The one who is blessing us, meaning the Spirit and the Father, really, with every spiritual blessing. See how well that fits? See how well it weaves together whether you read the Petrine text first or Paul's text first. Is that cute or what? Let's do it with Paul's text first. Okay? The one who is blessing us, Father in view, with every spiritual blessing. Now let's go to Peter. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by means of the sanctifying work of the Spirit. You see how that forms a complete thought? Now let's do it in reverse. This is what's so classic about the writing here. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by means of the sanctifying work of the Spirit, the one who is blessing us with every spiritual blessing. See, it refers either first to the Spirit, if you read Peter first, or it re refers first to the Father if you read Paul first. And both of them are God, co-equal, co-eternal, co-infinite, blah, blah, blah. See? Is this perfect or what? Tell me God didn't write scripture. And I'll laugh in your face. That's the end of this for this increment because I'm just losing it. I'm so excited. Okay, so now let's pick up where we left off. We left off at 41. That's not a whole word. So, in a sense, we got an overlap. So, and Paul is saying, by in, with, in, those living in the heavens via Christ. And that takes you to 47 AD, Christ being long dead at that point. The equivalent text in Peter would be here. I supacoin kai rantismon kai matas Jesu Christo. Okay, because this is starting, you know, there's, there's a little bit of an overlap here because this is starting like right here. So we're going to just read them as whole clauses. All right. Now, depending on whether you want to read Paul first or Peter first, notice something really important. My pastor taught us this time again when he exegeted scripture. Always track prepositions. That's why I parse the clause by, you know, what are equivalent to prepositional phrases. Okay, that's why I parse it this way in Paul. And that's why I'm doing it also in Peter. Ice. That's into. Because of, in this particular case. Because of. It's real important to understanding why Paul and Peter are playing, why Peter's playing on Paul the way he is. Paul is stressing in. Or with, because epuranois, ranois means people in heaven. Okay, with those in heaven. In other words, the spiritual blessings we're getting are like those that are already in heaven. 
In other words, you don't have to die to get heaven. You can be right down here and have heaven on earth. That's the whole testimony of God versus Satan. Okay, you can have heaven on earth even when you're suffering. Okay? So Paul is stressing the preposition N. means with, by means of, because of, in its own sense of conduit. All right? Whereas Peter is stressing ice, and this is also because of, and it, it really means because of, and Peter's favorite use is with reference to, as a result of, and Paul uses ice a lot also. So in is the result of ice. You go into something as a result of which you're in. Okay? So if we read Peter first, because of that connection between the prepositions, then it, the phrase would start, because of the obedience, even the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, we are with those in the heavens in Christ, via Christ. See how it, it, it's a complete thought. Due to his obedience and his atoning blood, we have, see in context, every spiritual blessing, with, those already in heaven by means of Christ. See, it's by means of Christ here and by means of Christ here. So it's a complete circle idea that you can't lose it, being stressed. You see the point? Isn't that cute? Because of the obedience, even the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, with those living in heaven via Christ. In other words, what's in ellipsis is we are. So you would say, because of the atoning, because of the obedience, even the atoning work of Jesus Christ, we are with those in heaven via Christ. We're down on earth, they're in heaven already, but we got our heavenly, heavenly blessings given us now. We get every spiritual blessing currently being blessed by God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Isn't that cute? So it's an antiphonal response to Paul who was written earlier in this clause. He's tracking it exactly. Now in Peter, however, this is going from 41 to 58. In Paul, we got to go farther because this is only taking you to 47. So we go down here and in order to complete the sentence, you got with, okay, with those who live in heaven via Christ, according as he elected us. So if you insert Peter first, you'd be saying, because of the obedience, even the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, we are with those in heaven in Christ, according as he elected us. Okay, even as he elected us is a smoother translation. You see, it completes the thought. And now we're at the same end point in the timeline. Okay, within a year or two. All right? You see that? Well, you could read this first and say, with those living in heaven via Christ, and then, it'll, well, actually, you'd have to start here. We have every spiritual blessing. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. With those in heaven via Christ, according as he elected us, because of the obedience, even the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. See how that thought is completed? See how it's antiphonal? Is this awesome or what? So if you were a pastor and you knew the meter, you would have a very firm idea of what Peter's trying to refer to when he says this, okay? And then we have to get now to 66 when Peter's writing. So our next phrase in Paul is, by means of whom before the founding of the world, okay, in him before the founding of the world, and then we get to the last 10 syllables of Peter to track exactly to 66. Grace to you, even the multiplying peace prosperity. Okay, of what? Of the word of God coming out. Because we're in him from the founding of the world. See, Paul's talking back, Peter's talking back to even as Paul was, you were foreknown. You were foreelected. Before the founding of the world, God knew you and he wanted you. And as a result, 
you get the grace of the scripture multiplying in your head and that too was appointed from before the founding of the world so how do you want to read this as one sentence in him before the founding of the world if we pick Paul first grace to you and multiplying peace and prosperity specifically with reference to scripture because of the meter you know it means specifically with reference to scripture because that's the kind of grace that was multiplying out to people during those days is this cool or what in him before the founding of the world grace to you even multiplying prosperity of the word of God See? And now Peter is at 66 AD where Paul was forecasting what was going to happen in the Roman Empire, 66, 68. I don't know if he knew he was going to die then. Maybe he did. That's why he breaks the clause there. Okay? Because by the time Ine, which is an infinitive, by the time Ine is spoken, by the time he writes it, or by this year, which is 68 AD in our terms, okay, if not 66. He's, he, he himself is in heaven. Ine means to be. Paul is in heaven at that time. The moment that verse, you know, that word is, is indicative of the year. Paul's in heaven at that point. And Peter knows that, of course, because Peter's writing because Paul's dead. So Paul's getting multiplication of peace and prosperity in heaven. See how clever that is? That's a cute little biographical note about Paul. And of course, Peter, as he'll tell you in 2 Peter, which is written a couple of months later, he'll tell you he knows he's going to die too. So this Ine also characterizes Peter. Peter will be in heaven, pronounced holy and blemished free. Isn't that cute? See why once you know the meter, you get so much more out of the text. Whereas if you're just looking at the text, it's enough to put you to sleep. Okay, you have to go slow with Bible anyhow. But when it's metered, look at how much more wealth of meaning is there. And it's all doctrinal. And this is what the readers at the time knew because they understood the meter. And so they were doing what I'm doing in this video. They were linking up this phrase to this phrase. So that they were tracking both Peter and Paul at the same time. So they knew what Peter was talking about. It was a no-brainer to somebody who was learning scripture by meter. They memorized scripture by syllable counts. So this was a no-brainer for them. This was very entertaining for them. It was more entertaining than our TV today. People loved playing with words like this in those days. That was much more meaningful to them. They could be sitting and, you know, weaving flax. They could be preparing dinner. And they could be playing with the syllable counts here versus here and enjoying whatever they were doing because of the excruciatingly gorgeous meaning of this compared to this in Antiphony. Okay? So now we come full circle to 66 AD, which is right here in Paul and right here in Peter. And from this point, Peter's going to go forward, still tracking to Paul, but he does an amazing thing. He now quotes Paul verbatim. And this is supposed to cover the period from 66 AD to 86 AD, or 68 to 88, in Paul's text. But he's going back to this part of what Paul says. And the question is, why? Why is he going to do that? And that's what we're going to have to pick up at the next increment because I don't know the answer right now. Peace out. Okay, so what is Peter doing here? With this phrase suddenly attaching to this. Because that's the, the same number of you know, syllables, 66 to 86. There's really one extra syllable, but you'll see why that's a, a kind of a wry thing to do in a minute. Let's just first look at the text comparison. Here you got Paul. In Nehemas Hagius Kayamomus, Katenopio Nautu and Agape. Okay? Translated, to be, for you to be. 
holy and blameless before him and it, before him means by his standards so that's why I got those extra words in English in love okay now what would you be saying if that were true if you were dead and you're in front of God you're holy you're blameless all of your past life whatever it was you did wrong doesn't matter now what would you be saying actor on a stage remember this is what you'd be saying. You logetas hoteos kai pater tu curio hemon Jesu Christu. Glory be, worthy of praise, honor, and glorification is God the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what you'd be saying. And that's, of course, what Revelation will end up depicting in Revelation 4 because that's when the rapture occurs. Revelation 4 1 is the rapture. Door open. John goes up. That's the rapture going up. Door closes at the end of verse uh, Revelation 4.1. Because nobody else is going up but church. John represents church in that verse. So you're standing in front of him now, Revelation 4. What are you going to be saying? You're going to be seeing the gorgeous Lord you believed in down here. And for so many times, you weren't sure if you were crazy. And now you know. Assuming the rapture happened tonight, what would you be saying? You're seeing Christ face to face now. Standing in front of him. What are you going to say? Oh, yeah, worthy of praise and honor and glorification is the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what you'd be saying. Okay? And what is Paul talking about here? What if the rapture happens at that time? Because these are all what if the rapture happens scenarios with Paul. Every single thing in, in the meter of Ephesians is what if a rapture happens in that year? What would happen? What would we be saying? And what should we be thinking versus what is the world doing? That's where the satire comes in. He's telling you what the world is doing too. Because what the world is not doing is what we're supposed to be doing. We are pronounced holy, blameless, blemish free. Well, as long as we're in the world, that's not true. Before him by his standard. Well, as long as we're down here, that's not true. I mean, we're sort of before him in that he's in heaven. But we're not standing in front of him. In agape, we're not, we're not in love down here. We're in fighting down here. We're in hypocrisy down here. You see why Paul's being satirical about the world down here versus heaven? And once you're in heaven, honey, what are you going to say? You like etos hoteos kai pater tu curiu hemon in Jesu Christu. Hmm? Are we going to be saying anything else or are we going to want to talk about anybody else? No. See how gorgeous this is? That's why that text in Peter is parallel to this text in Paul. Occurring in the same syllables, meaning the same years. And what's really ironic about this is at the time this text is, is written by Paul, and at the time this text is written by Peter, within a few months... Peter's going to join Paul in heaven, and Peter, like Paul, will be holy and blameless before God by God's own standard in love. That's exactly what's going to happen. That's Peter's own eulogy, so to speak. And it's Paul's eulogy, eulogetas. That's where we get the English word eulogy from. That's the eulogy of Peter. That's the eulogy of Paul. And that's exactly what they said, you know, within months of each other at the time Peter wrote his letter. Is that cute or what? Okay? I submit to you that it's very cute. Now I gotta say one thing about this phrase in agape. Okay? It's it's a technique, it's a classical Greek technique. Hello? Classical Greek? People think Peter was stupid? <clears throat> Sorry, I had to get my glasses. That's a classical Greek technique. I learned from Morwood's book on classical Greek about this. It's an attic rhetorical device that appends the beginning of the next line at the end of the previous line of a verse to stress the word or phrase. Okay? And it's recognized by Bible translators. They put in agape at the end of verse 4, but it syntactically begins verse 5. So what it's doing is he's stressing the poor foreordination of God by means of love. In other words, love is the integrity of God. I've done a lot of videos on that. 
theologians have been puzzling for centuries about what's the head attribute of God's head. What what is it that he? How does he choose his decisions? Love. Okay, and a lot of people think love is just an emotional well, in humans. It is, but not in God. Love is the, the, the whole reason to want to even be God. Love is the reason why he loves righteousness. Love is the reason why he loves truth. Love is the reason why you can trust God. He is love. He doesn't merely love like we do. He is love. And he chooses to be loved by his own will. Because you can choose to love or not. Okay? So that's why this is so important. We're before him due to his love. And due to his love, he foreordained us. And Peter expects you to know that when he writes this. Okay? He expects you to know all that. Because he's quoting Paul. And he expects you to accommodate your syllables and to understand that you're now in Peter at the same place that Paul is right here. See? 66 to 86, 20 syllables. 66 to 86, 20 syllables. Alright? And they're writing their own epitaph. I don't know if Paul knew he was going to die when he wrote Ephesians. Peter sure knows he's going to die when he writes this. So he's delivering a eulogy of what Paul is saying because at the time Peter writes, Paul had just died and that's what Paul is. Holy, blemish free, before God, by his standard, in love. And so Peter's giving a eulogy to Paul and also at the same time realizes this is going to be his own epitaph. You see why that's so cute? See how much more you get out of the text knowing that it's metered? You're getting a lot of isagogics you would never understand. You know, I, I, I had a guy who calls himself a pastor. This was years ago. Tell me that he could teach the whole book of Ephesians in one month. I'm sorry, it took my own pastor seven whopping years of daily Bible classes to go through the book of Ephesians. Yeah, because my pastor was paying attention, but he didn't know the meter. See, everything my pastor ever taught is proven by the meter. I'm really surprised to know this. Okay, but you know what? Look how much you get out of it knowing the meter. To be holy and blameless before him, if you were raptured at that point. Because the rapture could have happened then. They were expecting it. They were expecting it because when Christ was 66, he would have been, as, he would have been dead as long as he was alive. And so they were thinking that was the redemption of this time, you know, being alive, paid for by 33 more years the world can go on living. So they expected the rapture between 66 and 73 AD. And part of the reason why you have preterism today is because the rapture didn't happen, and so everybody got disaffected. That story is told in uh, 2 Peter 3 and in uh, the uh, 1 John 2. Okay, people got real disaffected when the rapture didn't happen according to the old Jewish schedule. This was the old Jewish schedule. But church didn't have a timeline deadline. It was based on how many bodies get built in church, not how long. It was as long as it takes for the bodies to be built. Because that's the new temple, which is Peter's theme. Okay, we're going to see more of that in the rest of his letter. But see, he's talking about the new temple being built, and that's why he's basing his timeline on when the old temple was destroyed. Because the second temple, which gave, which was destroyed by Herod, now Herod's third temple, which he doesn't even complete until 64 AD, right here. This is when Herod's, temp, Herod's temple gets completed. It's no sooner completed than, than Jerusalem goes under siege. Okay, and it began in earnest in 66. And then 73 was Masada. Between, of course, is the Holy Temple going down. Peter knows all this. Everybody knew this. The 40 years was almost up from Christ's death. So they were waiting for it. And then they had other ideas that, well, okay, when he was dead for 33 years, that maybe it'll come then. Maybe the rapture will come then. And then three years after that, the temple will go down. Because the temple is supposed to go down mid-trip or Daniel 9.27. You see how rich this is? On a personal biographical note, Peter's delivering a eulogy about Paul, who at the time Paul wrote, 10 years after he wrote, he either knew or didn't know, 
that he would be in front of God in love, holy and blameless. And Peter, when he writes this, is giving not only a eulogy to Paul, but he knows that's going to happen to him too. And that's what Peter's going to say the minute he's dead. That's what all of us are going to say the minute we're dead. We're going to be glorifying God as much as we can. That's all we're ever going to want to do. Because he's so gorgeous, you just look at him and it's like, oh, please give me a way to have a cost so I can glorify you. Even though it's, you know, I can't do anything for you, I need it. Yeah, well, forever and ever we'll be given ways to glorify God. Because we need it. Because we got to express our gratitude for all this. All right? You see the point? See how much richer this is when you know what time is being referenced? You know that this is about the rapture occurring during that time and about Paul's death. Peter knows it's about Paul's death, so this is a eulogy, and he appends this. So it's like, we are pronounced to be holy, blemish-free, before him by a standard in love. Therefore, you logetas hoteos kai pata tut kuriu chemon Jesu Christu. Glory be to God, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see? Or you could say this at the beginning. Glory to God, the Father our Lord and uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Since we are pronounced to be holy, blameless, blemish-free before him by his standard in love. <coughs> okay, I'm going to have to get some water. And that ends this increment.